I composed this in July of 2014. The Female Myth of Phaedra and Its Philosophical Reception by the Western Mind Feminist philosophy can gain much by investigating the portrayal of females in the Greek or Roman mythological tradition. Such investigations produce insights into human nature, and how men and women perceive each other, as well as how society perceives them. An excellent mythic figure for such study is the young Cretan wife of Theseus, the Minotaur Slayer. Phaedra was known in antiquity as the daughter of Minos, king of Crete. Crete is the largest and one of the southernmost islands of Greece. Modern scholars know Crete as the hub of the Minoan civilization, one of the greatest early cultures in Europe. Linguists and archaeologists are familiar with Crete as the starting point for the study of Linear A and B. 1. The mysterious language eventually decoded with great aid from Alice Kohler. 2. The ancient Greeks possessed a general but varying concept of the Phaedra myth, organized and canonized by Euripides in his tragedy Hippolytus. In the Hippolytus Euripides portrays Phaedra as the Minoan princess who has married Theseus, ruler of Athens. Theseus already had an illegitimate son by an Amazon at the time of his marriage with Phaedra. This son, Hippolytus, is a young man by the time of the play. He is a chaste, unmarried devotee to the goddess Artemis whom he shows his reverence for by spending his days in the woods hunting. Aphrodite, the goddess of passionate love, resents Hippolytus for his chastity and refusal to indulge in her favored form of behavior. As a result, Aphrodite plots revenge upon Hippolytus by making his stepmother Phaedra fall in love with him. Phaedra, ashamed by her unnatural and unlawful desire, although instigated by a goddess, starves herself in order to keep her body from giving in to her dishonorable lust. After a botched attempt to fix the situation by a handmaid, Hippolytus eventually discovers, to his horror, his stepmother's feelings. After a wrathful reaction by Hippolytus, Phaedra kills herself for fear of her husband's reaction once he finds out the truth of the situation. This play can be interpreted in several ways. On the one hand the character Hippolytus can be read as having blatantly dishonored the goddess Aphrodite. Servant. Then, King, how comes it that for a holy goddess you have not even a word of salutation? Hippolytus. Which goddess? Be careful or you will find that tongue of yours may make a serious mistake. Servant. This goddess here who stands before your gates, the goddess Cypris. Hippolytus. I worship her but from a long way off, for I am chaste. Latimore, 241. Clearly, within the ancient Greek mind, a blatant disregard for a god or goddess warrants a just punishment. On the other hand one may point out that right after these lines Hippolytus prays to Aphrodite, and therefore is guiltless because he reveres her and acknowledges her divinity. His prayer is not indicative of one who senses guilt. He does not ask forgiveness of himself, but of his servant. Hippolytus shows that he does not see how he has angered and continues to anger Aphrodite. This leads to how the character of Phaedra is read within this context. She appears quite innocent in this favorable depiction by Euripides. She valiantly struggles against what she feels is an unnatural desire. She not only mortifies her stomach, but even kills herself in order to prevent her thought from reaching fruition. The Greek audience must sympathize with her as they know that a goddess, Aphrodite, is responsible for Phaedra's suffering. We know this iteration of the Phaedra story by Euripides is more favorable to Phaedra than a bodier rendition that earned much criticism for the Greek playwright when he was a younger artist. Therefore we know that Euripides was very sensitive to his portrayal of Phaedra and his audience's perception of her role in the plot. Stepping back, it appears that the myth of the female character Phaedra was used by Euripides to point out two issues. First, he seems to show a contradiction between lust and chastity. On the one hand Hippolytus devotes himself entirely to chaste living, yet he seems unable to reconcile this virtue with the natural desire for intimate relations. His chaste behavior directly results in his predicament with Aphrodite and Phaedra, and ultimately his own demise. 
lust personified seems to protest against Hippolytus existence. Perhaps here the fetter myth is used to show a discrepancy, a disunion, in the Greek pishy between chastity and lust. Possibly, if Hippolytus had ignored chastity and given into normal marital relations, then Aphrodite would have never been upset with him and caused Phaedra's unnatural lust. The second issue Euripides points out is the conflict within Greek polytheism. Two goddess war against each other, and use human beings as a chessboard. Devotion to Artemis causes Hippolytus to be hated by Aphrodite. This is a common theme in ancient Greek mythology, one that is carried into the Roman world. Virgil, the Augustan-era Roman poet, hearkens to this them when he writes, Tante nemi missiles of Isiri? Can resentment so fierce dwell in heavenly breasts? 3. In reference to the wrath of Juno at the beginning of the Aeneid. Furthermore, Phaedra seems to be the only humble victim within the story. She is not at fault for desiring Hippolytus, at the will of Aphrodite. Hippolytus is hubris tick though and so is his father Theseus. They are both blinded by their pride and arrogance. Their overactions are in some ways more responsible for the tragedy than Aphrodite's meddling. And that brings us to another point. Consider that although the men of the story seem to rule on Earth, the entire plot is driven by the action of female goddesses Aphrodite and Artemis. Sophocles wrote another play based on the character Phaedra, however that version as well as Euripides' first Hippolytus play have both been lost to time. It is important to note that there is no strict canonical understanding of the myth of Phaedra, but that Euripides' Hippolytus gives us our best shot at making such a standard. Roman antiquity, particularly from the last century before the Common Era until the middle of the first century of the Common Era, seems to read Phaedra less favorably than Euripides' audience. Cicero, a Roman statesman, wrote the De Officii on duties in 44 BCE during a time of great political upheaval. Ostensibly it is an exhortative correspondence to his profligate son studying in Greece, in reality it is a significant ethical treatise and contribution to the late Roman Republican strand of Stoic philosophy. Cicero was probably reacting to what he saw as the moral decay of Rome at his time. His Officii was a systematic treatise crafted an attempt to call back his fellow citizens from improper conduct. Cicero twice alludes to the Phaedra myth, first in text 32 of Book 1 and second in text 94 of Book 3. Each instance transpires amidst an elaboration of Cicero's theory of promise-breaking. First I shall assess Cicero's theory of promise-breaking in preparation for discussing the two passages in the off that include references to the Phaedra myth. Three parts compose Cicero's off. The first book is a description of the honorable, and the second book is a description of the useful. The third book addresses the conflict between the honorable and the apparently useful throughout the off. Cicero analyzes the concept justice. Within this investigation he treats the topic of promise breaking and its relation to justice. Cicero believes that occasions often arise when acts which seem wholly worthy of the just person and the man we label good change their character and become just the opposite. Sometimes it becomes justifiable to sideline and not to proceed with the intention to restore a deposit, or to keep a promise, or to do what truth and good faith demand. Walsh 12. This principle of pledge breaching is founded upon the rule that when the principles of justice are violated by circumstances, the obligations fixed to the pledge also change. The principles of justice are first, that no person should be harmed, second, that the common good is observed. In view of this ethical entreaty we see that Cicero will use cases to support his theory that present an oath having been made prior to a change in conditions that violate the principles of justice. Cicero's first use of the Phaedra myth arises immediately after his first qualification towards promise breaking in text 31 of book 1. In the elaboration upon his theory of promise breaking Cicero refers to three specimens. First, Neptune's keeping of Theseus' wish for the god to kill Theseus' son Hippolytus. Second, a hypothetical case when familial sickness precludes a public speaking commitment. Third, 
Another speculative scenario in which violent coercion precipitates the unwilling creation of an oath, for Cicero, and most others, these are clear precedents for the breaking of an oath. He writes, If Neptune had not carried out the promise which he made to Decius, the king would not have been bereaved of his son Hippolytus. The story goes that as the third of his three wishes, Theseus in a fit of anger prayed for the death of Hippolytus, and when his wish was granted, he was plunged into overwhelming grief. Four key traits characterize this reference of the Hippolytus myth. First, Neptune's omniscience is the condition that precipitates the circumstance for oath-breaking. The god knows both that Hippolytus is innocent, and that Theseus makes his wish out of ignorance. Second, Theseus is the initiator of the pledge, but the responsibility for its fruition falls upon Neptune. Third, Hippolytus and Theseus are the victims of this ethical violation, the act of keeping the vow. Fourth, in the eyes of Cicero Neptune bears the guilt for the consequences of keeping the vow. Cicero mentions that Theseus behaved under a fit of passion, further emphasizing Neptune's role by admitting some pardon to Theseus. It is also significant to note that in this case, the Hippolytus myth is the only literary or mythological reference provided. Cicero's other two examples are conjectural. This is not what happens in the second emergence of the legend. The second surfacing of the Hippolytus myth in the off occurs in Book 3. Book 3 apologizes for Cicero's ethical philosophy when conflict arises between the honorable and the apparently useful. In the middle section of this book Cicero addresses the conflict between the apparently useful and demands of justice. Because justice is dealt with, promise breaking is treated, as it is a topic under justice. In the second treatment of oath breaching, Cicero restates his theory in a condensed form, again, promises need not be kept if they are not useful to the people who exacted them, Walsh 116. This restatement emphasizes the first explanation of the theory, without reference to the obligation of the other party in the oath contract. This repositioning of emphasis informs the reader that Cicero will be concerned with the initiator of the vow and the examples he will give in order to illuminate his principle. Cicero then provides three mythological events that support his theory. All of them are concrete stories from the Greek mythological tradition. First he proffers the story of Phaedon, second the story of Hippolytus, and third the sacrifice of Iphigenia. Cicero writes, or again, take the promise which Theseus exacted from Neptune. Neptune gave three wishes, and he requested the death of his son Hippolytus, for the father suspected goings on between his son and the stepmother. But when his wish was granted, Theseus was overwhelmed with grief. This second use of the Hippolytus myth by Cicero distinguishes itself from the first with respect to the force attributed to Theseus' role as agent in the tragedy. The mitigating effect of mentioning Theseus' anger does not occur here. Cicero did not harp on Neptune's culpability in carrying out an obligation that does not benefit the exactor of the promise. While the first mention of the myth portrays Neptune as the agent granting wishes to Theseus who seems to accept the opportunity, here Cicero presented a Theseus who actively pulls the wish from Neptune. So what do these examples have to do with Phaedra? and her influence on philosophy? First, Cicero seems to understand the Phaedra myth in a light more sympathetic to Hippolytus and somewhat condemnatory of Theseus. Cicero accepts the premises of the Phaedra situation, and uses it as a didactic tool to illustrate his own ethical theory. He seems little concerned with Phaedra's plight and tragedy. Ovid Writing not long after Cicero, used the Phaedra myth for less philosophical purposes. Reference is made to her in line 498 of Book 15 of his Metamorphoses. You may have heard some mention of Hippolytus, how he met his death through the easy credence of his father and the wiles of his accursed stepmother, Miller, 401. Ovid, more so than Cicero, sketches Phaedra in a culpable manner. Now Hippolytus is the victim of his stepmother's trickery. Ovid presents Hippolytus as helplessly trapped between two tragically flawed parents. Seneca, a later Roman Stoic, 
wrote several tragedies during his exile from Rome. His corpus mimics Euripides in that many of the Roman poets' plays have a Euripidean parallel. Seneca's Phaedra is yet again, in the same vein as Cicero and Ovid, a less forgiving depiction of the young Minoan princess. The role of Aphrodite's revenge is downplayed, and the culpable willingness of Phaedra's desire is emphasized. The end of the play summarizes this distribution of sentiment by Seneca. Theseus, confronted with the mangled body of his son Hippolytus and the corpse of his wife Phaedra, appropriates his value judgment at the end of the play. Theseus says of his son, You will need multiple burials, but of his wife, and as for that woman three quarters bury her, and may the heavy earth crush down her wicked head. Wilson, 38. Although Seneca seems to shift the perceptions of the characters Hippolytus and Phaedra from Euripides' vision, Many scholars have read both characters as equally guilty transgressors of the same behavior. Phaedra succumbed to inordinate sexual desire, and Hippolytus succumbed to inordinate sexual abstinacy. Seneca, acting as a philosopher through the medium of tragedy, expounds upon his ethical theory that the proper use of sexual intimacy is a mean between two extremes. It is not a strike to say that Seneca used his tragedies for philosophical ends because he is known after all for his extensive Stoic training. At the end of the Roman period of Phaedra portrayals, we see a transformation in her image. During the Greek period she was a sympathetically presented victim of Aphrodite's benevolence and the rashness of the man in her life. In the Roman period she became a slightly less deep and more guilty version of her Greek iteration. Racine, the 17th century French playwright was the next to pick up the Phaedra myth. This time the goddesses play a more decisive role in the action, Cairn Cross 23. Venus uses Hippolytus as the instrument for engendering lust within Phaedra, as opposed to earlier versions where the goddess puts the passion directly into the Minoan stepmother. Scholars have noted a unique sense of guilt in the character of Racine's Phaedra that is not present in earlier versions. Rosine's Phaedra experiences two pangs of guilt throughout the play. First, in Act IV when Hippolytus confesses his love for Arisha to Theseus. At this moment Phaedra is on the verge of confessing the truth, in obedience to her conscience. She tragically refrains upon being enraged by the thought of Hippolytus' love for another. Second, at the very end of the play, after Hippolytus' death has been reported to Theseus, Phaedra admits her wrongdoing in one last final act of honesty. Investigation of his son's memoirs reveals that Racine was experiencing an intense surge of religious sentiment at the time of his writing Pater, Cairn Cross 131. This intense sense of guilt and inner battle within Phaedra's conscience is what separates Racine's work from Seneca's and Euripides' telling of the Phaedra myth. Here we see that Racine has resurrected the mythical female from her relegation during the Roman period. She is not the extreme, guilty stepmother of Seneca's play. Rather, Racine's Phaedra is almost heroic in her battle to overcome her inner desires and obey her conscience against divine meddling. The Phaedra myth has been picked up many times in the past 150 years.